Hola, mi gente. This is Philip Johnson um, introducing Brigida Toronio, who's host of Uno Souls. Hello, Philip. How are you? I'm good, Uno Souls Chat. Welcome to this week's episode. We are chatting with Pat Worth, um, the executive director for Turning Point Suffragists Memorial. Yes, uh, I just really enjoyed my chat with her. She is really an amazing lady, and I think everybody's going to really enjoy what she has to say. Yeah, I think so too, you know, and I think um, this episode is an interesting one where we are finding ourselves focusing on a period, you know, post-COVID, which I think we'll get into more and more as we go along. And, you know, talking about gathering at this new memorial that's coming to the, you know, the family of DC memorials, um, you know, it'll physically be located in Morton, Virginia, which has very historical significance, which Pat goes into. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's sort of a turning point uh, as well for the Turning Point Suffragist Memorial that we are, you know, thinking about the, this, this future coming to us now. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really a long time in coming and, and really, I'm so glad that we're finally going to have this memorial. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm excited for it too. And excited for everyone to listen to, you know, the story of the memorial and um, why don't we just hop right into it and hear what Pat has to say. Sounds great. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? My name is Brigida Toronio. Welcome to Uno Souls Chat. As we are all adjusting to this greatly changed societal situation, I've been called to chat with Uno Souls, and they are beacons of light in our community. They were beacons of light before COVID-19, and they continue to be just that. We want to connect all of us together in hope, courage, and love. I am honored today to be chatting with Pat Worth, an Uno Soul. She is the executive director and CEO of the Turning Point Suffragist Memorial Association. Welcome, Pat. Hi, Brigida. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate with you. Oh, thank you so much for, for being here. I appreciate it. Tell me, Pat, how have you been doing during, the, during this time? How have you been coping? It's been a, it's been a challenge, I think, for everybody. Um, we've all had to kind of come to a screeching halt and assess the situation, assess um, our businesses, uh, our uh, exposure to this coronavirus and how it might affect us. Um, how it affects our families, uh, how it has affected our ability to interact. So, um, you know, co coping has been um, kind of a day, at, you know, every, you know, one day at a time. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of hard to plan in advance on what you're going to do because you just don't know what was going to happen next as far as the virus went. Um, and, in addition to the virus uh, uh, affecting us, we had a major election this year. And as you know, my organization is all about voting rights for women. And this was, this was the 100th year anniversary of women gaining the vote. And yes. so for those of us that have, uh, that spend uh, you know, all of our time uh, looking at voting rights and that sort of thing, you know, that was an element that kind of figured into what we were doing and, and you know, watching, you know, what was happening on that level. Um, so it's been a, it's been a, uh, it's been a challenging year. Um, you may recall that, uh, you know, I do Thanksgiving at my home for my family and have been doing it for 40 years. And this yes. is the first year that we did not plan to do that. And my younger yeah. son lives in Texas. And I sent an email out to the family and said, well, here's the deal. David's not coming home. David, we're canceling your air flight, your airfare, because you just, you know, it's not safe for you to travel. Right. We need to listen to the medical scientists and do what they say. And they say, don't, don't travel, don't gather. Mm -hmm. And then to my rest of my family that lives locally, 
I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cook Thanksgiving dinner, the usual, and you're going to bring containers over, mm. fill up and leave, and then we'll go on Zoom and we'll get together that way because we, I just right. you know, felt that it was so important for us to say, for us to uh, stay safe. So we, we've tried to be a little innovative that way. Well, that was a creative idea. Yeah, you know, but like you, I'm a mama bear. I love my family. I love my kids. I love my grandchildren. So um, it makes my heart ache when we can't get together. I mean, it's it's really difficult. Yeah. So we just do the best we can. And as much as, um, you know, I think Zoom has been a great uh, tool for those of us to at least try to get together this way. Right. So, you know, we've availed ourselves of that, not as much as maybe some other families do, but we certainly ha have. And so that's been helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, um, I, I've always talked about Zoom and, you know, it, it has its good points and its bad points, but it's definitely been an important tool during this time to keep all of us connected. And I've right. even been able to connect with family in Argentina and you know, um, it's, it's been really, it's been really important, but yeah, you are a wonderful cook. I mean, you, you had some beautiful dishes and, but I think, you know, on, on Thanksgiving, we ended up having a beautiful day. We did. Right? So your, your family was able to do something outdoors. Yeah, so, um, you know, the temperature at my home turned out to be 70 degrees. So we quickly mm -hmm. cleaned up the deck because we really didn't plan on, you know, having any entertaining things in November out there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, everybody came over wearing masks and um, they filled up their plates and went outside and we literally distanced everywhere. And uh, we were able to at least be in the same location. We weren't around the same table or anything like that, but it was good to just be able to see, you know, to see everybody in person. Um, yeah. So that, that was meaningful. Um, I felt really bad that my son um, in Texas wasn't with us and my older grandson um, had gone to visit his uh, significant other's mother um, in one of the Carolinas, so he wasn't with us either. But it was some of us, it was a small group, and it, but it was just nice to, to be able to look out and actually see living, breathing family members for a change because we hadn't had that. That makes such a difference. It, it really does, the physical presence. So I, I'm so glad you got to experience that. That's wonderful. We did. Um, and I see behind you, you have a, a mock-up of the, the suffragist memorial. Right. I would love to hear more about that. If you could please tell us. Well, this project um, to build the only national memorial in the United States to honor wow. the millions of women who fought for the vote for women um, uh, to, to build this memorial in their honor. A grassroots organization um, came together in about 2008 with the concept and it grew and it, you know, it transitioned and it changed and so forth. And we kind of nailed it down in in 2016 as to what it was going to actually look like. And um, memorials are, are not cheap. And this memorial, uh, for all intents and purposes, is a lot less expensive than most national memorials, which start, you know, 25 million and go up. Wow. It's very beautiful. It's very poignant. Every element in the memorial has to do and is meaningful with regard to the suffrage movement, what the women did, uh, that sort of thing. So it'll be a visual symbol and an educational tool to elevate these millions of women to their proper place in history. Um, I do, present, you may recall, I do presentations all over the country, well, I was doing presentations. Well, I still do presentations all over the country. I'm doing them by Zoom now, but I used okay. to go all over. Yeah. And um, uh, and I the title of my presentation has always been the best kept secret in American history. Oh. And that's because, as one of our historians that has uh, been with us for years likes to say, the white men who wrote the history books didn't think the suffrage movement was important. So they left it out. Wow. And yet and yet what actually happened was when the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920, 
27 million women got the right to vote. Wow, and it was the greatest million. expansion of democracy in our country ever. Wow. It was the greatest. It, so it was huge. I mean, it was a huge yeah. undertaking and it, it, it lasted um, over seven decades, three generations of women and men um, fighting for this. So it was, it was a, a pretty huge undertaking. So, so um, because 2020 is the centennial anniversary of passage of the 19th Amendment, you know, we had planned on having a huge celebration. We had, uh, we had uh, thought that the memorial would be completed in, mm -hmm. in the, the anniversary date was um, August 26th. We had planned for the memorial to be finished by then. Oh, okay. uh, and we were, we had been, we had a dedication committee of many people that had been working literally months on getting this uh, dedication and celebration together. We were expecting a thousand people from across the country. Uh, we have uh, enjoyed donations from every state in the country wow. for this memorial. I mean, there's a, a huge uh, support for for this. Wonderful. And um, and then you know, COVID hit and everything came to a screeching halt, including mm -hmm. our fundraising. And so there was some major funding that we were expecting from a couple of uh, different government entities that didn't come through. Mm -hmm. So it it has it's been an emotional roller coaster this year um, as far as the memorial goes. Wow. Um, but we uh, later in the year um, those government entities were able to find funding for us and so we are completely funded now. Wow, we, that's uh, a what a tremendous thing that you've done, Pat, to be able to, yeah. to get to, to the full funding of the memorial. That's wonderful. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it was, uh, like I said, we, we actually thought in February of this year that we had all the funding. Mm -hmm. And the board went so far as to have cake and champagne because we, we were told we were going to get this funding. And then, and then within a couple of weeks, um, COVID hit and everything just stopped. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh boy, now, now what are we going to do? And um, mm -hmm. I think as the months went on and they were able to assess their financial situation and also they had always looked at our project as an investment um, uh, for the community, for the state, for the country. Uh, this will be a major tourist attraction that will bring, um, you know, will, will bring people from all over who will stay in hotels. I and mean, that was one of the things we were working on with our dedication committee. We were lining up hotels. Uh, we had buses coming in from, from Wisconsin, from Massachusetts, from the Carolinas. I mean, we literally had thousands of people that were planning on coming. I'm so, sure. It's so so it, was, it, it was a major change. But um, uh, what, what, what happened was that our major funder has been Fairfax County. The memorial is being built in Lorton, Virginia. Yeah, can you please tell us that story of why it's being built in Lorton? Sure. Um, uh, in 1919, in 1917, sorry, in 1917, um, one of the women's suffrage organizations started picketing the White House. Uh, the president was Woodrow Wilson at the time. And they were trying to get him to um, support women's suffrage. And he had not supported women's suffrage. He didn't think women needed to vote. And every time they would go in, he would say, look, well, there's nothing I can do. This is a state issue. You need to, you know, you need to, um, you, you need to let the states decide whether women can vote or not. And so in January of 1917, um, the National women's party started picketing the White House. And um, it, it was a kind of an amusing thing um, that had never happened before. These women were trailblazers. Uh, the idea of picketing the White House had never happened in our country ever. Oh. And it was kind of an amusing thing. Uh, when President Wilson was reelected as president, he had campaigned saying that he would not get our country involved in World War One. 
Well, as soon as he was elected, that kind of changed. Mm -hmm. And in the, you know, and in 1917, uh, the United States joined World War I. And there were other women's suffrage organizations at the time. And, and during the war effort, those organizations stood down. But this women's organization, the National Women's Party said, we're not standing down. We, we, you know, we are sending our young men to Germany to fight the Kaiser, to save democracy for the German people. Hello, what about democracy for women in our country? So they didn't stand down. Yeah. And, um, but, but once we got involved in the war, President Wilson was no longer amused having these women out there holding picket signs, criticizing him, criticizing the war. And in June of 1917, he started having the women arrested oh. on trumped up charges of obstructing traffic on the sidewalk. Oh. It was just a made up, it was a made up thing that wasn't even real. Hmm. And initially, um, when these women you know, were hauled off to a courtroom, you know, the judges um, were kind of amazed that this was happening and he wanted the women to pay fines and they refused to pay the fines because they said we didn't break any laws. Can't make up a law and say that we're <laughs> breaking it when there isn't any law. Yeah. So in June of 1917, <clears throat> they started sending women um, to jail. And the majority of them were sent to the Occoquan workhouse in Lorton, Virginia. They were kept in inhumane conditions. Um, no, you know, no really, no heat, heating in the winter time. Um, they were given, you know, urine soaked mattresses, vomit encrusted blankets, uh, maggot infested food. It, it was just, the, the, the conditions were horrific. And in November of 2000, and, or I mean of 1917, there was a train load of women that came in, um, 33 women that came in on the night of November 14th. <clears throat> and um, the women's barracks were physically located in a wooden building, it was like a dormitory, across the street from the big brick jail. And when the women were brought to this wooden building, the superintendent, his name was Whitaker, was waiting for them. And he had a group of men that were not in uniform. And when one of the spokes, the spokeswoman for the group says, we demand to be treated as political prisoners, and they weren't, they were treated as criminals. Mm. Um, he had these men seize the women and drag them across the street in the dark and throw them into punishment cells. Oh my God. Um, they were beaten, they were tortured, they were given no food or water for over 36 hours. These women ra uh, ranged in age from 19 to 73. I mean, it was really, really horrible. And when word mm -hmm. leaked out, and it did, mm -hmm. And I've heard various stories of how it leaked out. So I, I can't say what exactly, which one was correct or maybe they were all correct. When it leaked out, um, it became a turning point mm -hmm. in the movement. That's where our name comes from. It became a turning point in the suffrage movement and caused President Wilson to go to Congress and seek an amendment. He did that about six weeks, six weeks after all this happened. This, this, and, and the event on November 14th has become known as the Night of Terror. And oh, if you Google, okay. if you Google Night of Terror, you can read all about it. It was really awful. Yeah, I remember there's a documentary that you showed us, right? Um, yeah, a, a movie about this. And yeah. it, it, it really, it showed all of this. It was, yep. it was really, really a sad, really sad. Yep. And so, um, uh, our memorial is being built on these historic prison grounds um, mm -hmm. where they were where they were jailed and where this torture took place. Wow, such an important <laughs> and, location for it yes. to be. Then. So yeah. yes, it's where the it's where the history took place, and that that's why that's why it's being built there. Because a lot of people say, well, why aren't you you know why aren't you building it in in Washington? 
it's very hard to build anything in Washington anymore. Um, sure. You know, there's just very limited space and, and um, but for our purposes, the history that we wanted to make sure people were aware of took place in Lorton, Virginia, in okay. that prison. So that's mm -hmm. where we felt it was the most appropriate place and the most appropriate site for this. Okay. All right. So it's Great. been um, it's been a it's been a challenging, very <laughs> challenging year. I mean, um, it's been an emotional roller coaster for me because, you know, first we had the money, then we didn't have the money, and then we did have the money, and we're we're well on our way in construction. We did start construction at the beginning of the year. Okay. And so the um, basic concrete elements are finished now, okay. and we're you know working on a lot of peripheral things. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that happened um, that was uh, very beneficial for our organization is in 2017, Congress established a Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission, mm -hmm. and it's comprised of 14 women uh, that were, were appointed by uh, elected officials. So, so half of them were appointed by Republicans and half were appointed by Democrats. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of this commission was to celebrate the centennial of women getting the vote, but, but more importantly, to spread the word about it. Because as I said, this is the best kept secret in American history. You know, most, most people don't know about it. And yeah. so they've done a tremendous job. I had the opportunity of getting involved with this organization from its very first meeting. They met in Washington. Their, their members are from all over the country, but they primarily met, met in Washington. And so I could actually personally go to the meetings and I got to meet a number of the commissioners and they loved our project. And they purchased for us um, three beautiful statues that there have already been made and are already installed in our memorial. So they're there. Wonderful. But the other thing that they did, and this was just amazing. We, I talked about the women picketing the White House. Yeah. And um, we were able to, one, one of the commissioners uh, was a, a secretary um, of the Department of Interior, which the National Park Service is under that. And the National Park Service oversees the grounds at the White House mm. and the fencing that goes around the White House. Mm -hmm. And I had read uh, somewhere in the Washington Post that they were going to be replacing that fence with a, a, a taller fence. Okay. So. I went to the commissioner who was, you know, I had uh, one of the top people at the Department of Interior and I said, do you suppose that we could get a piece of that historic fence and put it in our memorial? Well, to make a long story short and to fast forward, the answer after took us a year, but the answer was yes. And we are getting a, we are getting a 24 foot section of the actual White House fence in front of which the women picketed. Oh my now, gosh, Pat, you I know. are so awesome. <laughs> oh my gosh, what a wonderful- I know, it's super, it's super exciting. I mean, it's super exciting. Yeah. And, and so um, we actually have a picture from um, 1917 of women in front. Well, well let, let me back up. So the, the White House, catalogs everything they you know this is section you know abc xyz or what whatever so they know exactly where everything i mean everything is cataloged as if it were in a museum i see and so this 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 historic fence is considered an artifact okay so we have to treat it as a museum piece okay actually yeah. So um, this this 24 foot section we th they were able to provide us with a picture of suffragists picketing in 1917 in front of the exact piece of fence that we are getting for our memorial. Oh my gosh. So when you, Brigitte, come and visit, yes. it's open and hopefully in the spring it'll be open. Okay. Um, we're going to have a, a we're, we, we're um, creating a plaza in front of that fence so that you can stand there and have your picture taken in front of it just like the suffragists did in 1917. That's amazing, Pat. Thank you so much for doing that. I mean, that I mean, what what you've done is created this 
historical moment. You know, I mean, this, this memorial will go down in history, you know, our children and grandchildren and, and at this point, you know, from the, our great grandchildren, you know, I mean, generations will now have this memory that was hidden from us for so long. And now it'll be a beautiful memorial. And thanks to you, Pat, for bringing it all together. I know how hard you worked for this, how hard you worked for every penny that was needed in order to get this important memorial um, built. So thank you so much for all of your hard work. Well, thank you, Brigitte, for saying that. But I, I mean, it wasn't just me. This, this was a collaborative effort, collaborative effort over many years. Um, you know, we literally have had thousands of contributors, you know, some, some very small uh, and, you know, up, up to, you know, uh, $800,000 um, from Fairfax County. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really been a very collaborative effort. I don't, you know, it's, it wasn't, you know, I, I was privileged to have this position and, and make the, um, the relationships that I did that were the valuable to help us get the funding that we needed, but it was, it was really a co collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. um, I will have to tell you, this is a true story. This almost makes me cry every time I tell it, but I had received a phone call from a, an elderly woman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And she asked me some questions, you know, about the memorial. I received an envelope from her with a $1 crumpled bill in it because it was all she could afford. Oh. To, to, to me, that was the most memorable donation we got. Yeah. Because yeah. that was so important to her. This memorial was so important to her that she was giving, you know, I'm thinking, what, what did she go? What kind of food did she go without for us to have this? Do you know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it yeah. was just the, the most touching donation that you can possibly imagine. But what it, a beautiful thing. Such it'll a... stay in my heart forever. Yeah, thank you for sharing that tender moment. I mean, you know, I mean, that just goes to show the importance of this, that somebody would go to that, you know, to that sacrifice, you know, yeah. to to make sure Exa that she was- Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and, and we, you know, I was able to forge some uh, wonderful relationships with some national organizations. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think of the suffrage movement as just being white, that it was just white women. And that is not the case at all. African-American women were very involved in the movement. Mm -hmm. um, they formed their own organizations. Racism was alive and well during that period of time. It still is now, but I mean, it just, mm -hmm. it just it's the way that it was. And, um, uh, and uh, in, in, uh, to see, 1913, that same organization, um, the, the same leaders of the organization that I mentioned that were doing the picketing, um, Alice Paul was one of the co-founders of that. They had a, the first women's rights parade in Washington, DC. And at the time, um, Howard University was a, 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 you know, a, an all African-American uh, co-ed college. Mm -hmm. And there was a sorority called the Alpha Kappa Alphas. And there were some women that were members of that sorority that wanted to march in that parade. And um, for a variety of reasons, they, they chose not to. But there were 22 young women who wanted to march. And so they broke away from the Alpha Kappa Alphas and they formed the Delta Sigma Theta sorority, which there's a huge uh, you know, you're located in Loudoun County. There's a huge uh, alum, alumna group in Loudoun County okay. and uh, of the Deltas. And the Deltas um, were formed and their very first social act was marching in that parade. The mm -hmm. Deltas have been a huge supporter of our memorial from the very, very beginning. So we're very grateful to them. They, they have um, uh, I forget how many hundreds of thousands of alumni across the, uh, actually across the world, they're an international organization, but they've been a big supporter of our group. 
um, the General Federation of Women's Clubs. They were founded in 1890 and they got on board with the suffrage movement in 1914. And they played a very big role at that time in moving, moving suffrage forward. Mm -hmm. And they have, uh, and th they have, um, uh, they have a national organization. They're, they're also international at this point, but they have a, a national organization and then they have regional groups within the country. They have state groups and then they have local groups. Mm -hmm. And we have had, um, we have just had, I can't tell you how many organizations, their chapters that have donated Why and their names are going to be on our, on our donor wall. And the League of right. Women Voters has been very big. Uh, they're organization was founded in 1920 by one of the most prominent suffrage leaders, Carrie Chapman Catt. Mm. Um, so uh, uh, there's other women's organizations, Zonta, um, the uh, NABO, the National Association of Women Business Owners has been one of our supporters and, and so forth. So, mm -hmm. so there's been a lot of organizations like that that have come together to support us, but, but you know, a lot of individual you know, a lot of individual um, people like that little lady up in Pittsburgh. Yeah, beautiful. So Pat, is it still possible to donate or, you know, if uh, someone wants to have their name on what you mentioned, like on the wall, is it still possible to do that? No, we've, we cut that off as of October 31st. We, we, we're still accepting um, donations and those donors' names will be put on our website. They're all, everybody is on our website now, but to be engraved on the wall, we had to cut that off because of the construct, because we're under construction and getting that part of it uh, completed uh, we needed to have a cutoff date for it. And so um, unfortunately you can't be on the wall, but you can still donate. And it, we okay. are 501 C3, okay. you okay. know, and so that can, that can still happen. So thank you for asking about that. Yeah, yeah, good. So we will, um, we, we can put the, the website address when we post this. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome to do that. Uh, well, this has been wonderful, Pat. My gosh, thank you for everything you've done. I, you know, I admire you so much. I realize that it, it took a huge team to, to get this accomplished, but I really think it made a huge difference that you were at the head of that team, the leader, because I thank really you. feel like you are a true leader. And, um, and I know that you've worn several entrepreneurial hats throughout your life. And um, I'm so honored to have known you for, for several years now and really admire the work that you do. Well, thank you, but it's vice versa. Uh, you know, Brigitte, I feel the same way about you and all, everything that you've done in, in your work in the community. And um, uh, I, I'll tell you, what, you know, for those who don't know, I owned an automotive service business in Loudoun County for 20 years. And so I got to make a lot of friends there. I'm still a member of the Dulles Chamber since 1997. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. and um, a great community. And um, I forged lifelong relationships there. And of course, you're one of them. So yeah. thank I'm you. very grateful for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, me too. And um, uh, I was wondering if you could leave us with some words of wisdom. Yeah, I think I can. As I said, my whole organization um, is about uh, educating people uh, about how important it is to stay vigilant in the quest for equal rights. That's what the suffragists were doing. And we just came through a uh, very contentious uh, presidential election. And so my words of wisdom are vote uh, how absolutely essential that it is don't ever think that your single vote doesn't count our organization is nonpartisan so we don't care who you vote for we we just we just want to say how important it is that as a citizen you, you know you that you should exercise your right and choose who you think our best leaders will be. Mm -hmm. um, without doing another whole history story, when the 19th Amendment was finally ratified, 
uh, it, it, Tennessee was the final state that did that in August of 1920. And the way that that got passed was by one vote, oh, one oh, vote. Wow. It's a really interesting story that we'll save for another time, but it was oh, one vote. We, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't, we women would not have gotten the vote in 1920 if that hadn't occurred. So wow. I think that my words of wisdom are, please take it seriously, you know, get, become informed. Um, make sure that you give your kids a civic lesson and talk about it around the dinner table and get them involved early, you know, about the process and so forth and, and to make sure you exercise your, your right to vote. Yeah, those are wonderful words of wisdom. Thank you so much, Pat. You know, I, I, this is a time I feel that we all need to be gentle with ourselves. You know, this is a a challenging time, a surreal time. And um, it's it's also a powerful time to love each other and to unite and to to have to strive for living in peace. And I, I wanna <laughs> yeah I want to thank you so much again for for chatting with me, Pat, and I honor the light in you. Well thank you so much, Brigida. And again I appreciate this opportunity. It was very special to have this 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 time with you and I can't wait to see you in person where I can give you a hug. <laughs> yes, I would Look, love that. Yeah, looking, forward looking, forward. To, looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. Thank you, Pat. You're welcome. Thank you, Brazita. Appreciate it. Wow, what a great conversation. Uh, just so important, such a historically important memorial that is coming to the Northern Virginia area. And I'm really excited to be able to experience it next spring. Um, do you have some more information you can share with us? Yeah, definitely, Philip. The Turning Point Suffragist Memorial is expected to open in spring of 2021 in Fairfax County in, in Lorton, Virginia, exactly. This national memorial will, will serve as a visual symbol and educational tool to elevate to their proper place in history the millions of women who fought for more than seven decades and finally won the right of women to vote in America 100 years ago in 1920. For further information, you can visit their website at www.suffragistmemorial.com. I think that's so great. The centennial celebration of that, absolutely. Suffragistmemorial.com. Yes. That's great. Yeah, yeah. until Thank next you. time. Hasta luego. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to Uno Souls Chat. You can find us at www.unosouls.com and on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I would love to hear from you if you would like to chat with me. Have a beautiful week and see you at the next episode.